tonight. Do you have kids? The federal parties want your vote. From parental leave to saving for university, what the parties are promising families in this election. Rosemary breaks it down. A Canadian accused of spying causes mayhem in a Moscow courtroom. Our camera is there. Hundreds of Ontario homes that could have asbestos installation. CBC News investigates. And as a woman, I'm especially stoked to join this group of people. <laughs> and the Canadian woman shaking up late night television. This is The National. We're now a week into the federal election campaign, and already we've seen leaders in cozy living rooms and busy daycares on crowded soccer fields. It's clear families are a big focus of parties trying to win your votes. And today, in two cities, in two separate provinces, the liberal and conservative leaders aim their pitches directly at parents. Rosie, this is the second straight day they did just that. Yeah, you bet, Andrew. Money for child care, for sports, for kids' educations, maternity leave tax breaks. The promises for families are certainly piling up. And that is a very carefully thought out plan. As Salima Shivji shows us, that demographic will hold power at the polls next month and parties need to woo them. Hello, how do you do? It's good to be with you. It may be sing-along time, but Justin Trudeau is speaking directly to the parents in the room and across the country. People should be focused on spending time with their baby, not worrying about how they'll pay their bills. And so today, we're taking another big step forward. An increase to the Canada Child Benefit for children under the age of one today on the heels of yesterday's promise to create more spaces for after-school programs. As Trudeau tries to make the case, his work in government is only half done. I love coming to Winnipeg. Andrew Scheer halfway across the country using the same playbook, promising his party would contribute more to registered education savings plans. The new Conservative government will help even more Canadians provide their kids with a smart start. A pitch he's been making for several days with several different tax credits. And all parties are putting families in the spotlight. That's why we chose to move Canada forward by investing in families. Improve the quality of life for hardworking families. Our priorities are the people behind me, the families that need affordable housing. Because they have to. <laughs> Young families, millennials, students voting for the first time are about a third of voters. Many feel they can't afford their mortgages or car payments, and many live right where the leaders need to pick up votes to get to power. You cannot win this election without winning the urban battlegrounds, and you can't win the urban battlegrounds without winning over these younger families who are feeling the pinch and looking for relief. Justin Trudeau won the young vote last time around. His challenge now is to keep it, even as Andrew Scheer does his best to expand his base with plenty of promises of his own. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. So the pitches are there, but are they meeting families where they need help the most? David Common asked a couple of parents today. Political parties see a pathway to victory through the playgrounds of the nation. So catering promises to parents is key. I have a coworker that had to take a month and a half unpaid leave because she couldn't get her kid into a daycare before going back to work. Stephanie Dunn is happy to hear about competing conservative and liberal plans to either rebate or remove federal taxes on maternity benefits. Like I do hear a lot of moms complain that they didn't realize that that happens. And though her son is just four months old, boosting federal contributions to RESPs is a welcome sign. Yet... I know it's free money and I know that it's a good investment and I will eventually, but I'm waiting till he's out of daycare because that to me is my priority. Paying daycare, not going into debt, just so my child can be taken care of during the day is more important to me. Climb up. Bozena likes some of what she's hearing today, but climbing through life is increasingly challenging. Wages aren't keeping pace with rising costs. It's those kind of worries political leaders are hearing and using in speaking with parents, especially women, who make up a greater proportion of voters who haven't yet chosen a party. Undecided as of right now. Well, then you're the person that these political parties want to be talking to and will be making promises to because you're valuable. I, I think it's, and it's hard because neither the Conservatives nor Liberals really are appealing to the parents completely. They're promising a little bit of something, 
but not everything what the parents want. Of course, there's certainly more political promises to come, more than a month left in the campaign, but parties know these are some of the people they need to convince. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. So another big issue for people feeling the squeeze is housing. The Liberals are targeting first-time home buyers with an announcement. They made that last week. Today, the NDP is pledging to build 500,000 affordable homes over 10 years on the day we learn just how unaffordable rent is in some parts of this country. According to the 2019 Canadian Rental Housing Index, these are the 20 least affordable ridings for rental housing. Check out to see if yours is there. Where at least a quarter of renters report spending half or more of their income on rent and utilities. There's one each in Nova Scotia, Quebec, Manitoba. There are 11 in Ontario, six in British Columbia. On the list, five swing ridings in this election. Tanya Fletcher shows why renters want to be on the agenda this time around. When my son gets here, uh, we, I pull out the trundle. Juan Pablo uh, Alperin and his seven-year-old son live in this shared house in East Vancouver. They rent a room for $820 a month. And he's not low income. He's an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University. I certainly didn't imagine myself uh, being almost 40 years old, having a good job and working and sort of being fairly established and considering that I would still be in this kind of a situation. Housing markets in Canada's biggest cities have started to soften, but rent is still considered far from affordable. A huge part of Vancouver's rental market is condos. In a new high-rise like this downtown, a small one-bedroom would easily run you $2,500 a month. What we really need is publicly owned rental stock so that we can keep the rents low. And this housing advocate says the federal leader should make it a cornerstone of their campaigns. Housing is a human right. And so what we really need is politicians that understand what that means, uh, say it publicly often, and are willing to fight for a bold, massive investments. But housing experts say there's a complication in a country this big. Well, the issue is one size may not fit every housing market. He says it can be tricky for the leaders to pitch a policy that will please all Canadians. At a federal level, you face the issue of you want to have a broad federal policy, but sometimes targeting interventions to markets where they're more important, uh, you know, obviously is going to make better sense. But for Al Perrin, affordable rent is a critical election issue, one he'll be hinging his vote on. I would certainly only support parties that are, have this issue front and centre. I think there does need to be some drastic measures. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. As much as campaigning is all about planning, it's also about quick thinking. And today, some of that got the Conservative war room into a bit of trouble. Katie Simpson takes us through it. At today's news conference, the RCMP commissioner was asked to weigh in on the SNC-Lavalin affair. I don't want to comment very much, but we do take all investigations uh, very seriously and uh, investigate to the fullest. Brenda Lucky's statement was not clear. We know the RCMP has been asking questions, but did she mean there's an official RCMP investigation? <laughs> the Conservative war room didn't wait for an explanation. Andrew Shear's top advisors immediately declared on Twitter, the RCMP confirms Justin Trudeau is under investigation for the SNC-Lavalin corruption scandal. Though at a campaign event, Shear himself didn't go that far. The RCMP commissioner was asked specifically whether or not uh, she would like Justin Trudeau to waive the cabinet confidentiality to allow her to do her job. And she specifically said that they take all investigations very seriously. The RCMP later clarified she was making a general statement and was not confirming anything. Shear's team had to backpedal, deleting the tweet, saying in a statement it was posted before the RCMP clarified their comments. This is not the first time Shear's team has made a claim without substantive evidence. I'll also look forward to Justin Trudeau's response to allegations that he took Faith Goldie out for drinks. This claim about Faith Goldie, who is banned from Facebook for hate speech, surfaced on Twitter, and it's not true. And before the election campaign began, he jumped on a British tabloid story that claimed an infamous child killer from the UK would be sent to Canada. As Prime Minister, I won't let him come here. Where does Trudeau stand? That story was debunked. It's not true, though this tweet has not been deleted. 
These self-inflicted mistakes are coming from Andrew Scheer's inner circle, and they could be used by his opponents to attack his credibility. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Rick Mercer also called out the Conservative Party today after a doctored partisan version of one of his famous rants started making the rounds online. Take 20 minutes out of your day and do what young people all over the world are dying to do. Vote. This rant from a 2011 Rick Mercer report is a call for young people to vote, period. Not, as this meme shows, to vote Conservative. This was sent out in a Facebook post by the Conservative Riding Association in Burnaby, North Seymour. Mercer tweeted the Conservatives to remove it. They told us the post was deleted, adding, the individual who shared it is not involved on the local campaign. Mercer called it, quote, just a straight-up fake. Mercer told CBC News that he's always been careful never to tell people how to vote, just to make sure that they do it. I like that message too, Adrian. The Prime Minister revealed today that Canada has been busy reassuring its allies. It has to, after a high-ranking RCMP employee was charged after allegedly collecting extremely sensitive information and then shopping it around. That puts Canada's credibility on the line amongst those countries with which it shares secrets. And as Evan Dyer tells us, the RCMP's commissioner is for the first time talking publicly about the case. We recognize that these allegations, if proven true, are extremely unsettling. Commissioner Brenda Lucky acknowledged today that her organization has been rocked by the arrest of someone who enjoyed the highest level of trust and that the consequences extend to Canada's allies. We are aware of the potential risk to operations of our partner agencies in Canada and abroad, and we are working in partnership to ensure mitigating strategies are in place. Of course, allies have had their own rogue agents, like Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning, and Ortis isn't the first Canadian accused of selling secrets. Naval officer Jeffrey Delisle sold NATO secrets to Russian military intelligence starting in 2007. There's been some comparisons with the uh, Jeff DeLille case, but DeLille was a junior um, naval officer. This is uh, the equivalent of director of military intelligence in the, uh, in, in the armed service, in, in the armed forces. After the DeLille case, the government changed the rules to require polygraph tests for new hires in sensitive jobs. But Lucky says Ortiz, who was already employed by the RCMP, never had to take one. This raises further questions about how an individual who was compromised or aggrieved enough uh, that he reached out to hostile actors, uh, that he could reach that sort of position of confidence. And I think that will cause further internal heartache and questioning. As director of the National Intelligence Coordination Center, Ortiz would have had access to some of the deepest secrets about ongoing operations. I'm sure there are some operations where lives could be at stake, especially if we're talking about the identification of uh, key informants or agents. What's happening now, insiders say, is a scramble to determine what secrets were leaked and to whom. Lacking certainty, any operation or source that Ortiz could have known about must now be considered potentially compromised. And that could lead to the shutdown of important operations around the world. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Now to a spy story with a bit of a twist. A Canadian man accused by Russia of spying has languished in prison for months. Well, today he turned his court appearance into a spectacle of defiance. Chris Brown was the only Canadian reporter to watch it all happen. When the doors opened on a secret hearing in Moscow today, Paul Whelan already knew what the decision would be. Moscow, Canada report is back in session. But he didn't accept it without a fight, turning the courtroom into a circus as the Ottawa-born former U.S. Marine made the case to the media that he's not a spy. I'm not allowed to give you details, so I can say that I was set up. Whelan was remanded in jail for several more months, though he says he's sick and needs care for a hernia. I have to tell you that my dog, Flora, she's a golden retriever, has received better medical care than I am receiving from the government of Russia. Whelan was at a fancy Moscow hotel last Christmas for a wedding when he claims a Russian friend, whom he's known for a decade, gave him a USB stick, he thought with holiday pics, but instead it had classified information and that friend turned out to be with Russia's secret police. Whelan's lawyer confirmed a big part of Russia's case 
involves secretly recorded conversations between the pair. I can say honestly, I haven't seen any convincing evidence. Calling for Paul's release. Whelan holds U.S., British and Irish citizenship too, and last week his sister Elizabeth pulled off a rare feat of bipartisanship by getting Republican and Democratic Congress members to jointly demand Russia release him. One theory is that Whelan may be swapped for a Russian held in the West, but his twin brother David told us today that he fears his brother will end up doing hard time in a Russian jail. I guess it depends. If, if the American government or some other government is willing to do some sort of trade, then that will get Paul out. But I think it's still, it's politically motivated and the Russians hold all the cards. In a tweet, Russia's foreign ministry claimed Whelan was caught red-handed and said complaints about Russia's handling of the case are disinformation. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. So those outbursts, Andrew, obviously that's pretty risky behavior mm. in a Russian courtroom. Sure. His brother says that it's, it's the stress of the situation that has pushed him to do this. You are looking at yet another Canadian in trouble overseas. Yeah, so, so a, a prominent Canadian labour leader who's in hot water after calling for sanctions against the Assad regime mm -hmm. in Syria to be lifted. So he's the vice president of the largest labour organisation in Canada. And as Katie Nicholson reports, it's not just what he said, but where he said it. It could be any other international summit, save for the large banners of Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad draped around the room. Not surprising then to see representatives from Turkey, Russia, Cuba and the Czech Republic. What was surprising? The presence of the Canadian Labour Congress's vice president, Donald Lafleur. Even more surprising, what he had to say about sanctions on Syria. It's completely unacceptable and uh, the, the Canadian, uh, Canadian Labour movement uh, does support the people in Syria and it, it, we're here to, to, to put pressure to take the sanctions away. Those words from a long-time labour leader, a big shock to his employer. To be clear, we weren't being officially represented there. He had no mandate from the CLC uh, to speak on our behalf or to represent the Congress and um, it uh, ought not to have been re represented that way. The labour-aligned NDP in the throes of an election campaign also taken aback issuing this statement. We are shocked by comments made by Mr. Lafleur, especially considering the treatment of workers in Syria. We do not endorse them. The NDP has often spoken strongly against slaughter perpetrated by the Syrian government and its allies. It's against our Canadian values as, as a country. Faguna Badewi, herself a Syrian refugee who now teaches human rights and law in Toronto, it's not just that a Canadian called for an end to sanctions against the country she fled, it's that he attended an event there at all. Him being there is shame. Uh, normalizing the situation with the Syrian regime is difficult now unless they took certain measures to, to protect um, uh, human rights, to, to you know, uh, stop the war, stop the killing and respect us as civilians. Now we did try repeatedly to contact Donald Lafleur and find out why he went to Syria and who paid for it. So far, no luck, but the Canadian Labour Congress is adamant it didn't foot any of the bill, and it says it will get to the bottom of it. Mm. And the, the Canadian Labour Congress, I mean, represents so many in the labour movement in this country. What are those unions saying about all of this? Well, we did try to contact about eight of the unions that are under the Canadian Labour Congress, and some who are outside of it. Nobody wanted to touch this with a 10-foot pole. Mm. I will tell you, we got a statement from Global Affairs Canada, which basically confirmed uh, how important it views the sanctions um, as a, a diplomatic tool with uh, with Syria. So that's pretty much uh, all we've got. Stay tuned and maybe we'll have a, an update for you tomorrow. Katie, thanks very much. You're welcome. Olympic bobsledder Kaylee Humphreys won't be competing for the United States anytime soon. Today a judge in Calgary refused her request to be released from the Canadian team. It was just the latest round in Humphreys' ongoing fight with Bobsleigh Canada. And as Devin Haru reports, it is far from over. So many of Kaylee Humphrey's greatest moments have come while wearing the maple leaf, something she's willing to give up to compete for the United States. Humphrey sued Bobsleigh Canada for refusing to release her from the team. Today, in a Calgary courtroom, she lost her case. She's obviously very disappointed with the decision and know that the actions that they're taking are simply to hamper uh, Kaylee's ability to compete for the United States. 
After funding and training Humphreys for more than a decade, Bobsleigh Canada doesn't want to let her go. We want Kaylee in our program. Um, Kaylee is uh, obviously going to be uh, a threat in the next Olympics and, and we, there's nothing more that we like to see other than Canadians standing on the podium. More than a year ago, Humphreys filed a harassment complaint with Bobsleigh Canada alleging head coach Todd Hayes emotionally and verbally abused her. This week, an internal investigation found her allegations were not substantiated. Our athletes in the current pool um, have clearly been outspoken that he's um, the one that they want in the program. Our team culture is something we've been working on specifically in the last two years. Uh, it's something that, that actually Todd brought in himself to, to kind of build that team atmosphere. Canada. But today's ruling isn't stopping Humphreys or her legal team. They plan on appealing the court decision. Under international rules, Humphreys requires release by the end of September to be able to compete for the U.S. this season. We'll be looking for a waiver of the release uh, requirement, uh, you know, because of the grossly unsportsmanlike positions being taken by Bobsleigh Canada. Humphrey. Humphrey still plans to attend a U.S. training camp as a guest this week. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. And more news just ahead on The National. Why a Saskatchewan nurse has to pay out tens of thousands of dollars over a Facebook post. Plus, CBC News investigates hundreds of Ontario homes may be hiding a deadly secret, dangerous, toxic asbestos. And next, a health update from Alex Trebek. The host of Jeopardy! has been battling pancreatic cancer. We'll hear from him in two minutes. Back. The political fate of Israel's longtime leaders being decided right now. Voters went to the polls today for the second time this year after Benjamin Netanyahu's minority government failed to build a coalition. Margaret Evans gives us a taste of the tension as results come in. This was an election all about getting the vote out, especially for Benjamin Netanyahu, the man who would remain king. He's now outlasted every other Israeli prime minister in terms of time in office, and he's going for a fifth term. He is a statesman of international stature. He represents us before the whole world. Start. Netanyahu himself voted early and then started popping up around Jerusalem, scolding supporters who hadn't voted yet. Listen up, he's saying. What are you doing here? Go vote Likud. But Netanyahu is a controversial figure in this country. Many Israelis say his populist rhetoric is a threat to liberal values. He is doing whatever he wants. Netanyahu is facing serious corruption allegations. Three indictments expected to be laid down next month. Shame, says this poster. Others say Netanyahu has given too much power to the ultra-Orthodox in exchange for their support, allowing state subsidies for yeshiva students and exemptions from military service. We work, we pay taxes, we go to the army, our children go to the army, and they just, uh, you know, live out of our money and out of our work. When the exit polls came out, they put Netanyahu and his main challenger, former Army Chief Benny Gantz, neck and neck. A blow to the man in danger of losing his crown, but who at the end of the night was still fighting to hold on to it. The last vote six months ago now revealed just how deep the fissures are in Israeli society. And for now, it's still too soon to tell whether this vote will heal them or simply reinforce them. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Jerusalem. Okay, let's get to Ian now in our national newsroom in Vancouver. He's watching developing stories for us. And Andrew, let's start in Ontario, where the auto workers' strike in the U.S. is already having an impact on Canada. This afternoon, General Motors sent home 1,200 workers from their Oshawa plant. GM says the strike in the U.S. is limiting the number of parts being shipped to Canada. 49,000 American auto workers walked off the job after negotiations for a new contract failed. Four RCMP officers are suing the federal government for what they say was a failure to provide proper training and equipment. 
The case stems from 2014 when a gunman shot and killed three Mounties in Moncton. The four plaintiffs were among the first on the scene. One of the officers said he still has nightmares about the murders and felt he could have stopped the gunman if he had a more powerful firearm. Jeopardy! host Alex Trebek has had what appears to be a setback and he's undergoing another round of chemotherapy. I lost about 12 pounds in a week and my numbers went sky high, much higher than they were when I was first diagnosed. So the doctors have decided that I have to undergo chemo again and that's what I'm doing. He shared the news on Good Morning America. It was earlier this year, the 79-year-old who began his career in Canada announced he had stage 4 pancreatic cancer. He says he's been overwhelmed with fatigue and depression, but says he has no plans to stop hosting. Hong Kong activists are trying to gain allies in the United States. Details on that and more developing stories in 20 minutes. Next on The National, CBC News investigates the toxic asbestos that may lie hidden in hundreds of Ontario homes and the quiet plan to clean it up. A CBC News Toronto Star investigation has discovered hundreds of homes in an Ontario city might be contaminated with a highly concentrated form of asbestos. Now, it was used for decades in manufacturing at the General Electric factory in Peterborough, and the leftovers were then sold as home insulation, but it is now known to cause cancer. As Dave Seglins explains, GE is trying to clean up the mess quietly. Douglas Avenue, number 558, a house with a story to tell. This is where I was uh, first brought up in uh, 1936. And uh, we lived here until 1950. Ernie Ferris remembers it well. At 14, his father arrived home one day from work at the General Electric plant with bags of cheap insulation. My dad uh, bought some surplus uh, asbestos material, which uh, they used in the GE. And we brought it in bags here and uh, we took it up into our attic and spread it around to improve the, the heat loss. And uh, never knew any different about any hazards. Or, so. For decades, GE employees around the neighborhood used the recycled material to line their houses. Peterborough has been home to General Electric for more than a century, building large machine engines, employing thousands. For a Canadian General Electric, progress is our most important product. But over the generations, as people have moved, families come and go, no one has kept track of which houses across town have asbestos hidden in the ceilings and walls. Be careful of these stairs, they're a little steep. Jim Dufresne found the white fluffy stuff in his attic when he began renovations. How deep was it in here? It was right up to my waist. I had a hard time getting through the window myself and when I did go through, I was standing in three feet of it. Asbestos. He knew instantly it came from the local GE factory. I spent 42 years of my life in there. Jim was a laborer alongside John Lewington. It was their job back in the 60s and 70s to climb up into GE's air filtration system every few months to gather up loose asbestos like this. To be sold as cheap insulation, they'd scoop it up with bare hands, truckloads at a time. They called it plucking the goose. Plucking the goose was going up onto the roof. You would pick up your car, your asbestos, stuff that into the barrel and wheel it down to the side of the building and lower it down into a truck. They didn't know then what we know now, that this kind of asbestos can cause cancer and be deadly if it gets in your lungs. There was no protective gear other than a pair of coveralls. There was no face mask, no nothing. There was nothing ever said that it was cancer causing or anything like that. Peterborough has prospered thanks to GE. Generating annual sales of $5 billion. But last year, after 125 years, the factory shut down, leaving behind a toxic mess. The site is leaching PCBs into the soil and aerial waterways. Hundreds of workers remain sick or have died from chemicals at the plant. And the asbestos? GE, several years ago, 
denied ever selling it when it was raised in the local newspaper. We are unaware of any GE Canada practice allowing or condoning sales or allowing employees to take material home, a GE spokesperson said. I looked at it for a couple seconds and I, I was so mad I was almost shaking. Dufresne and others who for decades loaded the trucks couldn't believe it. They'd for years unwittingly helped to spread the hazardous material across town and now their employer was denying it. They went hunting for proof in the local archives and found a copy of GE's factory newspaper from 1956. There was an ad in the paper in the Works News, if you wanted to insulate your attic, they've got asbestos you can insulate your attic with, and it's, I think it was three cents a pound. 1,500 pounds a month with advice. Installed between the ceiling joists in uninsulated homes, asbestos fluff helps to hold the heat in and cold out. I was so mad because they lied about it. I, I've got the proof right in there, Dave. GE still doesn't acknowledge it ever sold its waste asbestos, but we've learned the company is quietly cleaning it up. They started a program to remove it from homes, but it's only been shared through word of mouth. GE's never told the public. Removal is dangerous work requiring certified inspectors who often find the material buried in attics under many layers. Left undisturbed, it poses little risk, but if stirred up or someone does a renovation, inhales it, it can be deadly. And GE's asbestos is particularly hazardous. Lab tests can easily identify it. While most old insulations that used to be sold over the counter contain three to five percent, GE's contains 70 percent asbestos. GE will now pay to remove it. The company will hire specialists to seal off homes, conduct air quality tests, even put owners up in hotels, all of it costing thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars per house. But most people in Peterborough have no idea about the GE program. The company has declined our request for an interview, but in a statement GE says, if residents believe their homes may have insulation with asbestos, they may call the GE Canada Environmental Programs Information Line. And for the first time, they're offering a 1-800 number for people to call. So far, GE has fixed 24 homes. If they've only done a couple of dozen, then that's just not even the tip of the iceberg. Keith Riel is a city councillor who years ago headed the GE Workers Union. He's angry that the company has kept its cleanup hush-hush. They should be advertising it. I mean, there's hundreds of homes here. I, I think it, uh, it behooves them to do the right thing. If homeowners don't know about GE's cleanup, you'd think Peterborough's medical officer of health would. But beyond fixing a few houses over a decade ago, she had no idea GE is running this program until we told her. It's a full program, mm -hmm. but they've not told people about mm. it. Like it's not some of the so people. So a best that we, kept secret. Sorry. I like a best kept secret. Well, it actually, it's very interesting because this today, this morning, we had a call from a member of the public asking about asbestos in their home. So people do continue to call us with concerns or inquiries about asbestos, and uh, certainly, um, I think if there still is a remediation program available, that this is something that we we definitely should be telling people about especially since Peterborough has a high rate of asbestos cancer, 40% higher than the rest of the province. Back on Douglas Avenue, where Ernie Ferris grew up, GE's been busy. They've cleaned up at least two houses, including Ernie's. A surprise to him when we told him. Several owners later, GE found that asbestos that he and his father laid down decades ago and cleaned it out, leaving Ernie all these years later with a new question. Well. My mom died with what they called was asthma. I just wonder whether it was asthma or whether it was something related to the asbestos. Jim Dufresne doesn't need to wonder. Long and active guy, his 42 years at the factory have taken their toll. I've had prostate cancer. They took a tumor off my bladder about three or four years ago. Uh, I got COPD. What effect has the asbestos had on you? The asbestos, uh, my breathing. Now retired, Dufresne struggles to get outdoors. He's got chronic lung problems from asbestos exposure working at GE. With a river next to his house, he still likes to fish and think and hope that GE will somehow make things right. Because it's wrong what they've done. They should be responsible for fixing everybody's house that they sold it to. He hopes by speaking out that health officials and General Electric will be forced once and for all 
to track down all the asbestos that for years he and other workers helped spread across the city. Hey! Dave Seglin, CBC News, Peterborough, Ontario. There have been dozens of General Electric factories across Canada and the United States, and in recent years, many of them have shut down or moved. GE won't say whether it's running asbestos cleanup programs in other communities. And next on The National, what should you be allowed to post on Facebook? Why one Saskatchewan nurse is fighting a $26,000 fine over a post. We're back in two. It's a case that's testing the balance between free speech and professional conduct. And today it landed in Saskatchewan's highest court. At the center, a nurse who complained on Facebook about the care her dying grandfather received. But as Bonnie Allen tells us, she's now fighting a $26,000 fine. It just, <clears throat> it's not right, everything that's happened. Carolyn Strom says she's exhausted. The registered nurse never imagined she'd be at the center of a high-profile Charter of Rights and Freedoms case. Apparently she made an institution and some who worked there uncomfortable. Back in 2015, Strom was on maternity leave when her grandfather died after being in palliative care. You don't ever expect to have a loved one treated other than with kindness and compassion. And so to hear that he wasn't, um, that, that, that really hurt. She posted on Facebook that his care had been subpar. She identified the small town care home but did not name any individuals or make any specific allegations. She urged staff to do better. Sure, I'm a nurse, but my concern was as a granddaughter. But the provincial regulatory body for nurses found Strom guilty of professional misconduct and fined her $26,000. It said Strom identified herself as a nurse on Facebook and should have taken her complaint through the proper channels. Today, in Saskatchewan's highest court, the association's lawyer argued that public interest is at stake. Canadians would be harmed if nurses could just say what they want about medical establishments based on how they feel that day, Canadians would lose trust in the health care system. But the Nurses Union and National Federation disagree. They represent tens of thousands of nurses who want their right to free speech protected. The decision that's being considered by the Court of Appeal here over the next couple of months, and that we argued here today, will affect every professional who belongs to a regulated profession in Canada. As the appeal judges deliberate, Carolyn Strom is convinced other nurses already feel silenced. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Ian's up next with more developing news. And the newest face in late night TV is Canadian. That's still ahead on The National. Welcome back. The U.S. Department of Justice is suing Edward Snowden. They say his new book violates secrecy agreements with U.S. intelligence agencies. That's something Snowden denies. People say I violated my oath because it was an oath of secrecy. <laughs> but there is no oath of secrecy. It, it does not exist. Snowden was making the comments while promoting his book, Permanent Record, at a Berlin event. The lawsuit claims the former NSA contractor should have submitted his manuscript for review before publication. Snowden has been accused of espionage after he leaked secret documents about U.S. surveillance programs. He's living in self-imposed exile in Russia. Hong Kong democracy activists were in the U.S. today speaking at a congressional hearing. It is a global fight. We are in the front lines of this global fight uh, to protect these universal values that we all cherish. They're urging U.S. Congress members to provide more active support for human rights in Hong Kong. This is the city marked 100 days of demonstrations, some of them marred by violent clashes. The legal battle over the suspension of parliament in the United Kingdom made its way to the country's highest court today, and it was once again met with protests. Demonstrators want Parliament reopened during the critical lead-up to the Brexit deadline at the end of October. Boris Johnson has taken a stance that is very undemocratic and is against the will of the people. And uh, we need to be able to express our views through Parliament. 
During the hearing, the government lawyer said the prime minister would comply if the suspension was found unlawful. The Supreme Court took up the case after two lower courts had conflicting rulings. A decision could come as soon as Friday. Next on The National, the new kid on the late night block. There's a lot of obvious ways I'm different. I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color. I feel it's a perspective we haven't seen in the late night space for a long, long time. The Canadian bringing big changes to U.S. TV. That's next. She is late night, has a new face and a new voice, and she's already shaking up network TV. Canada's own Lily Singh made her much-anticipated debut on NBC last night, and the Scarborough, Ontario native hopes her brand of funny will set her apart from the current male-dominated lineup. Deshauna Reed on how she's being received. Hello, my name is Lily, and I ain't a white man. What's up? My skin got some color, and it ain't a spray tan. Canadian comedian Lily Singh says she's ready to disrupt the late night lineup. And the YouTube star turned NBC host did just that, with the premiere of her new show, A Little Late with Lily Singh. The 30 year old is the only woman of color to currently host a late night show on a major network. I'm not your traditional talk show host. I mean, the media Singh took over longtime host Carson Daly's 1.35 a.m. slot, which he held for 18 seasons. Come on, I'm more than just a bisexual woman of color, okay? It's a complete coincidence that I chose a network whose logo is also the pride flag. <laughs> a little late's oh, executive that? producer says he knew Singh was the voice the network needed. Her vision, late night without the politics. Because I think you can turn on any one of these shows right now and for the most part you're getting the same messaging uh, you know every every single day but politics is what many of her late night counterparts have used to bolster their audiences Irwin believes Singh's perspective and voice is what viewers want you're not tuning in because of who is on the show that night you're tuning in because you have connected with that particular piece of talent Listen, buddy, Dwayne, Rock, what are you doing here? Oh, my hormones. <laughs> NBC hey, hey, hopes hormones. audiences connect with Singh in the same way she connected with 15 million subscribers on her YouTube channel, an audience she built on her own. She has tremendous crossover potential because she's already demonstrated as a YouTuber the ability to make a lot of content, a lot of versatile content that resonates with a large fan base. Another challenge ahead, adapting from the wild, wild west of YouTube to network TV. You got this. In terms of her actual characters and some of the themes from her channel, it will be interesting to see how she transitions into the new medium without alienating her old fans. Now, I know we just started the interview, and I don't want to make this all about me, but, like, how do you think <laughs> I'm doing thus far? You are, you are killing it. Do you think so? Now it's up to sing to keep the momentum going. Shoshana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, next on The National, it is their job to respond to emergency calls. But what happened when two paramedics were in a crash? That's next. These New Brunswick paramedics were responding to the call of duty when they wound up in their own emergency situation. Now, their ambulance was struck and crashed, but that didn't stop them. Immediately climbing out of their flipped vehicle, they rushed to aid the other driver involved. And that is our moment tonight. No, that was my first time being a patient. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen very often. The back of our ambulance was hit by another oncoming car and uh, it hit hard enough that we uh, flipped over on our side. First thing that we did as soon as we hit the ground was I got a hold of dispatch and mm -hmm. said that we had been in an accident and to send another vehicle to the 911 call we were going to. Yeah. It was definitely scary at first. Yeah. Our adrenaline just kind of kicked in and we just uh, tried to get ourselves out of that situation as fast as we could. I don't think it was a decision. <laughs> I don't think so either. I think it was just, you know, I was good, Mackenzie was good. But there's another person that was just in this accident that's never been in an accident probably and we deal with this stuff every single day, so. It's important to us to make sure that people 
you know, even though it was the ambulance that was involved in the collision, that they still feel safe. Pretty wild. It's definitely the most dangerous part of our job, yeah. for sure. Uh, so, you know, you hear them talk a lot about their training. I don't know that it prepares you for having to suddenly flip a switch that quickly. But as I understand it, everybody's okay, right? Mm. Yeah, they see, so first of all, those two should have their own show. They seem so comfortable in front of the camera. So, you know, somebody should, should have them do some kind of reality show on paramedics. And also, they seem to be pretty lighthearted about it. So I assume nothing bad happened also on the call they didn't make it to. Mm. But clearly, I mean, at the same time, a sense of duty is a powerful thing. And it's a good thing that theirs kicked in and their adrenaline kicked in at just the right time. That's The National for this Tuesday, September 17th. Have a great night. Good night. Good night.